All right, welcome back to the BTN studio or BTN TV. Once again, I'm Michael Baker, uh, executive editor with BTN, and today we have a three for one special <laughs> here. So I'd like to introduce Paul Raven with Confer, uh, Conferma, rather, uh, Clive Cordelius with Visa, and Mark Corbett with Thrust Carbon. So, so we're going to figure out why uh, why all three of these gentlemen are sitting here together. Um, so let's let's start talking about sustainability and. Um, uh, and talk about how Thrust and uh, Confirma are working together. You have a new partnership. So, uh, Paul, would you like to talk about this partnership? Yeah, certainly. Um, so, uh, yeah, from, from Confirma Pay's point of view, we've been looking to try and extend the data points that we actually capture in relation to purchases. Um, and obviously, sustainability is a, is a major requirement now from our customer base. And so what we were looking for is best-in-class partner. Um, and we started talking to Thrust maybe about six months ago to see how we could collaborate and cooperate. Um, and on the back of that, now what we've been able to do is launch our first iteration of the product, which is essentially capturing our spend that we get on all of our virtual payments, passing that over to Thrust and getting um, an emissions value back, which we are going to then be able to display in our mobile application. And obviously, and that's why Clive's here, because from a Visa point of view, that's the, the third wheel, if you like, in the collaboration as well. All right, and, and Mark, uh, kind of what, what drew you to confirm it as a partner? Yeah, so I mean, first of all, we're, we're delighted this is now live and, uh, and really rocking and rolling. And, you know, fundamentally, we're at a stage where any display uh, and access of emissions is just absolutely vital in educating consumers, you know, at every point of um, through their traveler journey, through to day to day decision making. And because if you don't have that data, if you can't get it easily accessible in a visually engaging format, then how are we going to change our behaviors? How are we going to get to net zero? Absolutely. And Clive, uh, talk about Visa's role in this uh, this partnership. Yeah, I mean, so for, for us, it's it's the kind of link with virtual payments. So we're, we're looking at how sustainability uh, and the capture of the carbon information is there for all of the payment products. Um, virtual is kind of the, the newest part of that suite, if you like, um, but also the most important. Uh, we're, we're seeing uh, a bigger uptake. You know, the virtual journey started with the more of the, the hotel use case. Um, we're seeing that expand with air and rail and um, even transaction fees from the travel management companies, um, but also with the work that we've done with Confirma Pay around taking that virtual card and actually putting it into Apple and Google Pay. It means that now you know you really actually across our suite of products, but but most importantly with the virtual piece is that you are able to capture all of your travel program. So that for you know that's why it was so important to make sure that we've got the carbon reporting as part of that virtual package. Absolutely, and that sort of leads to my next question: is you know we we see a lot of um, different strategies in trying to calculate carbon footprints and to, to determine things, but kind of how is the payment sector uh, especially positioned to be able to play this role? Yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting one actually because I, I'd say it's something that we are still doing a lot of research on um, because I think that companies have lots of different options around. You know, whether it's their supply chain, um, whether it's their T&E program, it, there's a whole host of data out there. And, and the reality is with, with the regulation that's there, the companies need to figure out a way of capturing all of this. Um, and, and in the travel sector especially, um, with, with you know, companies like Thrush, you can actually um, go really deep on certain categories to make sure you're giving people the information up front. Now, from a payment perspective, we're also then looking at, right, what does that mean from a supply chain where do Visa play in that space and where do we actually partner with other companies so that from a corporate perspective, you've got the breadth of data you need to be making the right decisions. All right, excellent. And Paul, from your, your customer standpoint, was this something that they were heavily demanding and that, that you responded to or, is, or are you sort of anticipating increased demand with this regulations of, of, up here up and, and such? Yeah, a bit of both, I think. Mm -hmm. um, so obviously there's a lot of noise around regulation for the larger organizations, um, particularly in North America, where they're being extremely proactive in terms of, you know, how are you going to manage your emissions? Not easy to manage emissions if you don't know what those are. So from our point of view, that's the first step. I think it's going to be a, a, a journey. I hate that phrase, but essentially where we're starting from is no visibility. And what we hope to do over time is get to as close to 100% visibility as possible in terms of the T&E spend and the impact that we've got there. So from our point of view, what we want to do is we want to make our customers as informed as possible. From our point of view, again, payment is absolutely central to that. So it's the only thing throughout all purchasing that you can actually come back to, have a consistent level of data, and then work with organizations like Thrust and Visa to start saying, well, look, this is the impact 
of the, the complete spend that you're offering. Mm -hmm. And you can do it in one place and you can do it in an automated manner because of the way that the virtual card process works. All right, and Mark, could you talk a little bit about the challenges of sort of getting um, kind of unified data around this, especially on the hotel side, because I've, I've, I've heard there's a lot of different ways, kind of every kind of hotel has, has their own way of, of looking at this. So how do you kind of get a, a uniform uh, presentation of data to, to present to customers? Yeah, it's a, it's a big question, a big topic. Uh, the, the way we really look at the entire methodology landscape, right, it's, it's the, finding the right methodology for the right data set. Right. So when we have limited amounts of information, then we are going to rely on more averages and so forth. Some of the trends we've seen, of course, in, in air, we can really dive into the aircraft type, the fuel burn, and all of these other amazing factors, load factors, cabin occupancy. Um, so we'll get you that most pinpoint precise number possible. Uh, the difference then with hotels is um, you can get all that information, but when I say you, like, who, who is that, right? Um, we need people going in and measuring these things. Um, uh, the HCMI is fantastic, GSTC. There are all amazing organizations who are driving that side forwards. Where we then sit is very much as the technology provider, the data enabler, um, pushing all that data out, right? Um, so it means that when, um, when someone's using their virtual card, uh, then all of that just gets processed, captured, automated brilliant. Uh, and then in terms of the future of hotel reporting, it's then also not just the carbon scores, it's then the the non the other sustainability factors, your water wastage, your net zero commitments, which hotels are uh, committed and moving forwards, mm -hmm. which ones are maybe are not. Uh, and again, where we sit by also working with TMCs and the OBTs, by putting all of this data front and center, um, if you're a hotel owner and you're seeing you've got a low score on, on your uh, hotels, then it's gosh, we need to change that. And, and maybe it's because they already have good data, they're just not telling anyone about it. Um, uh, maybe they've got good data that's not verified. And then it, it puts that pressure on them to do so. And again, um, ev everyone in this room who's driving change and, and um, challenging the industry to a certain degree as well, helps everyone move forwards. And then ultimately it means the customer, you know, gets a much better experience. Absolutely, and, and you, you really need the information on both sides, don't you? Because you, you, you want to have it in front of the travelers so they, they can make informed decisions, but then you need yeah. it in the back end for the reporting. So it's you, you just kind of yeah, move all absolutely. the way around. Yeah, so. absolutely. We, we float between all of those uh, yes. environments and you know right right in the middle of the travel and tech ecosystem. All right, great. So I, I want to talk a little about um, kind of larger trends around uh, uh, virtual cards as well, especially because we're sort of in a new reality in, in terms of travel where sure. we're seeing a lot more companies are having, you know, maybe dispersed workforces and, and uh, having to move in for internal meetings. And so you probably have employees who are now traveling who, who haven't historically been travelers. They probably aren't yeah. issued corporate cards and things like that. So, so what are some of the new opportunities for virtual cards in, in this new world that we're living in? I mean, I don't think they're new opportunities. I think they're opportunities that people are beginning to realize have uh, always been there. Um, but I, again, obviously I would say that. So we've been talking about virtual payment for 10 years plus. Um, I think what's happened now is that the applications have just become very clear. So if you, like you say, you have got a disparate workforce, how are you actually going to be able to provide them with funds? Um, one of the most interesting things is, you know, corporate responsibility now when you're sort of in a situation where you can send a traveler to somewhere for a conference or whatever, and typically they would be paying extras and claiming those back. Well, actually, if you were then asked to um, uh, stay in place for a period of time, how do you ensure that particular traveler, A, has the funds to be able to do that, and B, that you know that that traveler is safe? And that, again, comes back to the payment record. I'll let Clive explain how that all flows through in terms of the technicalities. But for us, what that allows us to see is real-time authorization information coming through. So not it's been billed in three days or not it's been billed in 30 days, but the moment that that card is tapped, the moment that, that card is actually actioned, we can see that information. That means me as a corporation, I can say, I'm good. My people on the ground are safe and they're able to actually um, remain safe. So I think that's the, the, the most obvious piece, but then, by extension, it's the mobile application. I know you're probably sure. closer to that than I am. Thanks, Paul. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that that's, um, you know, Paul and I worked together in my previous uh, my previous company before Visa as well. And uh, it, it, I mean, I, I know Paul said he doesn't like the, the expression, but it has been a journey. You know, you, you, you kind of, there was um, this gap, you know, there was this, the only central pay product was a lodge card, uh, which has been around for, you know, what, 35 years. Uh, and, and virtual card was the evolution of that to mean that you could add other things that are centrally billed. Um, but it, it, it was then, right, how do you expand it to the other payment types? Working with Confirmer Pay to add the virtual card into Apple and Google means that it really is endless. You know, whether it is, as Paul said, while you're on a trip, you know, whether it is all of your on-the-go costs, um, whether it's a meeting, an event, 
So meeting and events, uh, a lot of the card payment relied on just things that happened centrally and they had to give cash to people for, for the things that were happening while they were there. And we've kind of got a perfect storm in some ways because of the fact that we've evolved the virtual payment to be in the wallet. Um, but we've also actually seen a massive uplift in contactless transactions. Mm -hmm. So if we look at our own data um, over the last year uh, for contactless transactions, it's um, across Europe, it is around 84% wow. of transactions that are now happen in a contactless way, whether that is with a physical card or with a wallet. And of course, the benefit of the wallet over just the, the tap and pay with the card is that you're not constrained by how much you can spend. You know, it can seriously be any amount. Well, excellent. Well, well gentlemen, unfortunately, we're out of time. I would, I would uh, love to hit some more topics, but thank you all so much for your time today. And thank you for joining us. Thank you. And uh, we'll be back for some more interviews in just a bit.